Welcome to this presentation on the hospital management of hyperglycemia. I am Dr. Om J. Lakhani. Today we'll discuss evidence-based approaches for managing hyperglycemia in both critically ill and non-critically ill hospitalized patients, focusing on practical clinical applications. This is the most comprehensive presentation on the topic, with synthesis of evidence up to 2026. We'll begin by examining the prevalence and mechanisms of hospital hyperglycemia, then discuss evidence-based targets and monitoring strategies. We'll cover management approaches for different clinical settings, special scenarios, and conclude with hypoglycemia prevention and effective transitions of care. Hospital hyperglycemia is remarkably common, affecting approximately one-third of general inpatients and up to 80% of critically ill patients. This is clinically significant because hyperglycemia is associated with poorer outcomes, including higher mortality rates, increased infection risk, and extended hospital stays. Multiple factors contribute to hyperglycemia in hospitalized patients. While pre-existing diabetes is obvious, many patients develop stress hyperglycemia due to counter-regulatory hormone release. Medications, particularly glucocorticoids, are common iatrogenic causes, while nutritional support and reduced mobility further exacerbate the problem. The pathophysiology of hospital hyperglycemia involves several interconnected mechanisms. Stress hormones like cortisol and catecholamines promote gluconeogenesis, while inflammatory cytokines induce insulin resistance. These processes create a hyperglycemic pro-inflammatory state that impairs immune function, endothelial function, and tissue healing. Hospital hyperglycemia presents in several patterns. Patients with known diabetes often show worsening control, while many cases are incidentally discovered on routine labs. Medication-induced hyperglycemia typically shows a temporal relationship with drug initiation, most commonly with glucocorticoids. Distinguishing stress hyperglycemia from previously undiagnosed diabetes is important for long-term management. Initial assessment should include a thorough history of diabetes status and previous control. Laboratory evaluation should include HbA1c if not available within three months. Point-of-care glucose monitoring frequency depends on nutritional status and insulin regimen, typically before meals and at bedtime for patients eating, or every four to six hours for NPO patients. Current guidelines recommend moderate glycemic targets that balance the risks of hyperglycemia against those of hypoglycemia. For most hospitalized non-critically ill adults, Target range is 100 to 180 mg per deciliter, while 140 to 180 mg per deciliter is appropriate for critically ill patients. These targets are supported by multiple professional organizations and reflect a shift away from the very tight control previously advocated. In critically ill patients, IV insulin infusion is the preferred treatment modality due to its rapid adjustability in response to changing clinical conditions. Protocols should specify initiation thresholds, calculation of initial rates, adjustment algorithms, and monitoring frequency. The target range of 140 to 180 mg per deciliter is supported by evidence showing increased hypoglycemia risk without outcome benefit at lower targets. Transitioning from IV to subcutaneous insulin requires careful planning to prevent rebound hyperglycemia. Calculate the total daily dose based on insulin requirements during a stable period, typically the previous six to eight hours. Start subcutaneous insulin one to two hours before discontinuing the infusion with approximately 50% as basal and 50% as nutritional and correctional components. Management approach should be tailored to the patient's prior diabetes status and current glycemic control. For those without known diabetes, but with elevated glucose, Begin with correctional insulin and escalate if hyperglycemia persists. Patients with insulin-treated diabetes should continue scheduled insulin with appropriate modifications based on clinical status. Physiologic insulin regimens include basal, nutritional, and correctional components. Basal insulin provides background coverage and typically comprises 40 to 50% of the total daily dose. Nutritional insulin covers meals, while correctional insulin addresses unexpected hyperglycemia. 
multiple randomized trials have demonstrated that scheduled basal bolus regimens achieve better glycemic control with less hypoglycemia than sliding scale insulin alone. Sliding scale insulin alone is a reactive approach that treats hyperglycemia after it occurs rather than preventing it. Multiple studies show it's ineffective as monotherapy for most hospitalized patients and is associated with greater glycemic variability. Non-insulin medications generally have limited roles in the hospital setting due to delayed onset, contraindications in acute illness, and limited flexibility. DPP-4 inhibitors may be continued in selected stable patients. SGLD2 inhibitors require caution but may benefit heart failure patients if no contraindications exist. Evidence for GLP-1 receptor agonists in the inpatient setting remains limited. Perioperative management requires careful planning. Preoperatively, hold oral agents and reduce basal insulin by 20 to 50% based on procedure duration and hypoglycemia risk. Intraoperatively, monitor glucose every two to four hours and consider IV insulin for major surgeries if glucose exceeds 180 mg per deciliter. Postoperatively, resume subcutaneous insulin when eating with doses adjusted based on nutritional intake and stress level. Nutritional support presents unique challenges for glycemic control. For continuous enteral feeds, use basal insulin plus regular insulin every six hours. If feeds are interrupted for two hours, hold prandial insulin and consider 10% dextrose at feed rate. For parenteral nutrition, regular insulin can be added directly to the TPN solution, starting with 0.1 units per gram dextrose, with supplemental subcutaneous insulin as needed. Insulin pumps may be continued during hospitalization if specific criteria are met. The patient must be physically and mentally able to manage the pump. The hospital must have expertise in pump management and the expected hospitalization should be brief. If these criteria aren't met, transition to a basal bolus regimen based on the patient's pump settings. Always document pump settings for future reference. Glucocorticoids primarily cause postprandial hyperglycemia with effects peaking 4 to 8 hours after administration. For once daily morning steroids, NPH insulin timed with steroid administration can match the glycemic profile. Alternatively, increase prandial insulin doses, particularly at lunch and dinner. Remember to proactively adjust insulin doses when steroids are tapered to prevent hypoglycemia. You can read a paper we published on this on IJEM. Elderly patients present unique challenges, including higher hypoglycemia risk and often atypical symptoms, primarily neurological rather than autonomic. Consider higher glycemic targets, 140 to 200 mg per deciliter, and use simplified insulin regimens when appropriate. Renal impairment is common and affects insulin clearance so dose adjustments are frequently needed. Always assess cognitive function and available support systems. Renal impairment significantly affects insulin metabolism and clearance. As a general rule, reduce insulin doses by approximately 25% when GFR is between 10 to 50 milli per minute and by about 50% when GFR is below 10 milli per minute. Insulin requirements may change during and after dialysis requiring close monitoring. Many oral agents are contraindicated or require dose adjustment in advanced kidney disease. Hypoglycemia prevention is a critical safety priority. Identify high-risk patients, including the elderly and those with renal or liver disease. Coordinate insulin administration with meals and ensure appropriate adjustments when nutritional intake changes. Consider reducing basal insulin overnight by approximately 20% to prevent nocturnal hypoglycemia. Standardized protocols for monitoring and treatment improve outcomes. Treatment protocols should distinguish between mild and severe hypoglycemia. For mild cases in conscious patients, administer 15 to 20 grams of fast-acting carbohydrate and recheck glucose in 15 minutes. For severe cases or unconscious patients, use IV 25% or 50% dextrose. After the event, Identify and address the cause and resume insulin at a reduced dose. 
typically 50% of previous. Hypoglycemia in hospitalized patients is associated with significant adverse outcomes, including increased mortality, length of stay, and costs. Each hypoglycemic event increases hospital costs by approximately $4,000. Risk factors include intensive insulin therapy, advanced age, and renal disease. In elderly patients, neurological symptoms often predominate over the classic autonomic symptoms, making detection more challenging. Stress hyperglycemia has important long-term implications. Patients with stress hyperglycemia have a three-fold increased risk of developing diabetes within three years. Hospitalization presents an opportunity to identify previously undiagnosed diabetes. HbA1c testing helps distinguish between stress hyperglycemia and pre-existing diabetes. Consider post-discharge diabetes screening for patients with stress hyperglycemia but normal HbA1c. Effective discharge planning should begin early during hospitalization. Carefully reconcile pre-admission and inpatient regimens, considering HbA1c and hospital course when determining the discharge plan. Simplify regimens when appropriate, particularly for patients with limited support or cognitive impairment. Ensure patients understand medication changes and have appropriate follow-up arranged. Patient education is crucial for successful transitions. Include medication administration techniques with hands-on practice for insulin injection if needed. Teach self-monitoring of blood glucose and hypoglycemia recognition and treatment. Provide clear written instructions in the patient's preferred language. The teach-back method is effective for assessing understanding. Ask patients to explain their regimen in their own words. Appropriate follow-up timing depends on several factors. Schedule follow-up within one month for patients with significant regimen changes and within one to two weeks for newly diagnosed diabetes. Recommend HbA1c testing two to three months after discharge to assess glycemic control. Continuous glucose monitoring may be beneficial for selected patients particularly those with hypoglycemia risk or complex insulin regimens. This algorithm summarizes our approach to hospital hyperglycemia management. In critical care, use IV insulin infusion targeting 140 to 180 mg per deciliter. In non-critical care, use basal bolus subcutaneous insulin targeting 100 to 180 mg per deciliter. Initial dosing ranges from 0.2 to 0.5 units per kilogram per day based on age, renal function, and clinical status. Adjust doses daily based on glucose patterns with particular attention to hypoglycemia risk. To summarize the key points, hospital hypoglycemia is common and associated with poorer outcomes. Evidence-based targets are 100 to 180 mg per deciliter for non-critical care and 140 to 180 mg per deciliter for critical care. Basal bolus insulin regimens are superior to sliding scale alone. Hypoglycemia prevention requires systematic risk assessment and standardized protocols. Effective transitions of care require early planning and appropriate follow-up. Thank you for your attention. This is probably the best PPT you will find on the topic. If you wish to download this presentation, please visit drppt.in. You too can generate a master presentation like this using the elite presentation mode of drppt.in. We are also planning a virtual workshop on insulin soon, so watch this space.